Okay, I'm panning. This is my audience. Everyone say hello. Hey. One, two, three, four, What's five, PG? six, seven, eight. I hate speeches. Okay. No, you do not. Hold this, Allison, or someone. Let's go see. No audio, please. Please. Shh. 143 million. That's the number of orphans that are on this earth right now. Just to give you an idea of what 143 million looks like. In 2010, the UN reported that Russia had about 142 million citizens. Just think about that for a minute. There are more orphans on this earth than Russians. To me, this is one of the most sad, the saddest statistics in our world today. And that's why I want to talk to you all about it. I've always said I never intend to be at the birth of my children because birth just grosses me out. But also because I feel called to adopt kids. But adoption is only a little part of what effective orphan care looks like. Um, much of what my speech is based on today comes from the AIDS Care Journal um, by the Family AIDS Caring Trust. And there are three steps to effective orphan care in today's world. The first would be to preserve the family unit. The next would be to see if the child is eligible for adoption. And then the third would be to place the child in his children's village. Children need stable, loving environments to develop into, and develop into people who can contribute to society. And the best way to do this is to make sure they grow up in a family. So that's why the first priority is for, when caring for orphans is to preserve the family unit. Natural disasters and war can separate families. And every effort should be made to ensure that families are reunited um, so they can continue to care for their child's physical and mental needs. The Family AIDS Caring Trust also says that the burden of care is falling on the elderly and the adolescents. As a result, we are seeing the emergence of grandparent-headed households and adolescent-headed households. If a child's immediate family is deceased, meaning their, their parents or their siblings, then the extended family should be reached out to to see if they are willing to care for this child's needs. Aunts, uncles, grandparents, and cousins are often willing to step up to the plate for this. Um, if a child's parents have died and no family, and there's no family for the child to be reunited with, the next step would be to see if um, the child is um, eligible for adoption. To be eligible for adoption, the child's parents have to be declared dead by the state. Um, a social worker named Leslie Hollingsworth published in a social work journal, uh, journal two years ago um, about the U.S. intercountry adoption and the Hague Convention. The Hague Convention was a convention that was held in 1989 and it put together a treaty um, discussing a, attempting to stop trafficking, abduction, and the sale of children. However, the treaty that the that countries have to agree to to continue with adoption um, is a little bit unrealistic and um, caused a lot of countries to close their adoption. The most um, famous of these is the Guatemalan 300, which is um, 300 families that are still waiting for their children to come home. Um, and from the looks of it, they will, they will never come home. Um, that's why international adoption has dra dr dropped drastically in the past decade. Um, that, with the financial commitment, um, adoption doesn't seem like um, a very realistic option at this point. Um, adoption also comes with a lot of baggage. Dr. Karen Priebus states in her book, The Connected Child, that the past of a child can really affect the future. Um, it is extremely uh, costly to bring a new child into a family because we don't know what kind of abuse um, the child has been through or the kind of trauma. Um, this may manifest in the child acting out violently um, or the child just being really subdued and not being able to bond with their new family. Um, it's very, very hard to welcome a child into a new family, but it can be, as, it can be equally rewarding. However, some children are not eligible for adoption, whether it be that the death certificates are lost or the state simply will not um, declare their parents dead. Um, in this case, a child should be placed um, in an institute or a children's village. Um, a children's village is uh, basically a compound where children are given family-style care. Um, I got to visit one two years ago in Haiti, and there are about five buildings, and each um, building houses about ten kids, and each one has a house mom from the community. So it's basically community run and the mom serves the kids meals every day and they pray for them and they send them to school. Um, and this is a really effective way of making sure that kids get um, family style care without having a family. 
Um, I don't even really want to talk about institutes because this should literally be the last, last, last option that child has to go to because institutes are really just looking to care for the child's immediate physical needs, which is a place to sleep and food. Um, this does not cater to the child's emotional needs, and um, it's almost a sure way of making sure that a child does not grow up to be a functioning adult. Um, many orphan children live in um, underdeveloped countries that are plagued with social, economic, and health problems, and none of those issues are going to go away unless the future generations are cared for in the present, which is why effective orphan care is so important today. I want to leave you all with a little food for thought. Um, a lady named Katie Davis moved to Uganda when she was 18 years old and started a ministry. And um, she wrote a book about it called Kisses for Katie. And in one of her chapters, she says a really powerful statement. And it's really long. I'm not going to read it to you all. But it essentially says that there are 43 million orphan children in our world. But there are over 7 billion people on the earth. And if only 2% of that 7 billion cared for just one more child, there would be no more statistics. Thank you. Can you can. And that person. Thank you. <laughs>